All right, Sharif, can you put your slide on presentation mode, please? Here we go. All right, Sharif, can you put your slide on presentation mode, please? So we have just over a thousand people signed up to attend uh, today's session. Uh, we have options that they can participate through Zoom here, or we have a live streaming version they can look at as well, which is the same thing, but just a live stream on YouTube. And uh, that is now live. I'm gonna go turn this on now and let people in. We're about 10 minutes out, just a few ready to go here. <clears throat> and we're officially started. Yeah, I'm really amazed, Ray, by this uh, registration. I think it speaks to all the personalities that are with us here today. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people really want to listen to you guys. The topic and the faculty, especially. How many do you normally get, Sheree? Well, I think, Ray, in our previous abdominal wall, maybe like three, four hundred registration. Oh, we had about three or four hundred registrations and maybe about 500 people showed up in the end. Uh, we did this uh, many years ago with the first omphalocele, a wall of abdominal wall defects. Webinar, we ended up with like uh, just over 1,700, I believe it was, right, attending. Right, right. So we have the uh, registration open through the entire event. So if people come in late, they can always, there's no, we're not cutting off any uh, access to this. Just welcoming everyone joining us. I see people probably have already about 10 countries represented just in the first couple of minutes of opening the webinar. So thank you all. I know for some of you, the time is very late at night. For some of you, it's very early. So really appreciate you joining us from all of the different parts of the world.
So Ray, just going through those who've uh, met, joined us so far, I think we've we've had people from every continent already. Yeah, it looks like it. It sure does. Sherry, amazing the, uh, the, um, the number of people from all over the world. So congratulations again. It's amazing how spread you are with the Hendrick project. Thanks, Miguel. No, it's really, I mean, I'm just humbled by seeing our audience. And, um, you know, our motto when we do this is we all learn together. And this is really what it means to have faculty from all over the world and also to have participants from all over the world. And I'm sure... Uh, Many of the participants will have comments that will also educate us all. It's not just about the faculty presentations. Agree. So no, thank you again and, and congrats again also. 
So Ray, I will wait for your signal. Um, it's exactly 10 o'clock, 10.01. And we have uh, just over 200 people already. So it's up to you if you want to wait. We can wait a, few, a couple more minutes if you like, or we can. Okay, let's wait another minute and see where we are. Sure. And I don't want to wait, make people wait here. Sure. So. Can I ask how often do you run these sessions, Emir? Um, well, we had a bit of a pause recently, but we, our, our idea is to have about two or three a year. Um, mm. And, uh, but we had a bit of a pause, but I think we'll, you know, looking at the turnout today, I think we'll definitely reignite those. Mm. That's a good idea. And we, plus we have webinars and web meetings and other topic areas as well, so. Right. Yeah, I mean, the Hendron project is really a wealth of education. It's really quite amazing. Um, and there are some, you know, there are some routine activities now that are occurring every month. Uh, I'll be making an announcement about one of those uh, after the presentations. Mm. So, Sharif, you want to get things rolling? Yes, I think so. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, we are literally a world community this morning. We have people from all continents. I think I've counted more than 50 countries already on, on the chat uh, greetings that I'm sure not everyone has told us uh, that they're here. So um, I just want to start again by uh, saying what I always say at the beginning of these, if there was no uh, Dr. Hendren, there would have been no Hendren project. And we all know that Dr. Hendren has uh, passed away uh, recently, but uh, this is really just to invoke his memory and his legacy to pediatric surgery and all he's done for our specialty. So uh, I really want to start again by honoring his memory and his legacy. Now, our uh, philosophy in creating these webinars is really the motto of we all learn together. Uh, and I think if you look at the faculty uh, who are here today and you look at the participants, um, we cannot illustrate that better. So we really have uh, a tremendous diversity of faculty who will bring us experiences from all over the world. I often say, like uh, people say, all politics are local and all pediatric surgery is local. You have to adjust what you do to your environment and your resources, and that's really going to be an example. Just a couple of logistics of how we're going to run the webinar today. So each of the faculty members has 10 minutes to present. Um, I've asked them to present their technique, a little bit about their environment, and if they have outcomes of that technique. If there's a couple of minutes left in their presentation, we'll entertain uh, you know, questions for them specifically, but most of the questions will follow in the half hour after the presentations. Now, there's been uh, an interest in running some uh, difficult cases by the group and presenting some additional techniques that are not covered. So we are not limited to complete this exactly in an hour and a half, but um, you know, feel free to leave at the, at the, the, the end of the 90 minutes, but um, we will likely keep the webinar open until uh, 11 o'clock our time or for a total of two hours if there's an interest in continuing the discussion. Um, so with that, I will introduce our first uh, speaker. I will stop sharing. Uh, so Dr. Kelly uh, Kogat is a member of uh, Pediatric Surgery Associates, which is a very busy uh, group private practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. She's currently the chief of staff of her hospital. Uh, Dr. Kogat completed medical school at Columbia University in the US and then surgery residency at the University of Rochester and Pediatric Surgery Fellowship in Memphis, Tennessee. She's actually right now on the East Coast, not too far from where I am in Montreal. And uh, Kelly, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen here and can everybody see this? Are we, are we good to go there? Perfect. And okay, great. Um, Let's just get started then. 
and slide control. Um, I am having difficulty moving my slide. There's oh, a there control. we go. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, let's see if, how I can get this to move. Um, so I like to talk about uh, our technique for uh, closing giant lymphatic seals. And basically, um, our goals are to get these closed um, as infants. Um, we try to minimize antibiotics. We try to allow the babies to use their intestinal tracts and minimize any physiologic alterations um, that come from trying to close um, such a big defect um, too early. And basically, um, our technique has uh, um, a, a goal of preventing the loss of abdominal domain and recruiting additional volume of the abdominal content so that we can do this as an infant. And basically we use multiple layers of tape and we use Tegaderm tape. It's a little bit stretchy. Um, it's sticky on the one side. Um, we've also used Ioban brand, um, which has some betadine um, uh, impregnated into it. Um, either, either is acceptable, any brand of um, you know, clear um, medical tape is fine. Um, and basically we add layers of tape on top of old layers of tape to try to uh, first uh, decrease the, um, the uh, put the contents of the belly cavity back into the belly and then to recruit domain and close the uh, defect. Uh, we don't use any antibiotics unless they're otherwise necessary for whatever other reasons. Um, we start feedings, um, feeding the baby. Um, we do this taping at the bedside with the baby awake or very, very minimally sedated. Babies are breathing on their own unless they're intubated for some other reason. Um, and um, we do this pretty much daily um, as tolerated. Um, I, um, Sometimes we um, get so much tape on the baby that we say, let's take everything off and start all over again. And so this is a picture here where we've taken the tape off. You can sort of see the skin around the um, phallocyl sac is a little bit wrinkly from having uh, tape on it. And uh, sometimes it starts lifting or it gets a little bit yucky underneath and we take everything off, wash it all up and start all over again. Um, and um, it's surprising um, within days, the contents are reduced. Um, underneath, I don't know if you can tell very well on this picture, we actually have a gauze um, stuffed on top of the sac, almost inverting the sac um, with the tape then over that. And the gauze is acting almost like a little tissue expander. And the sac is actually uh, inverted into the belly here uh, with everything reduced. Um, so the second goal, once you get everything reduced, is to recruit some abdominal domain, um, mostly muscle fascia um, and skin, try to get that to the midline. Um, and so we kind of keep going, even though everything's already reduced. You can see a picture here where the sac's kind of all shriveled up, everything's on the inside, and we're still putting a little bit of tape on it, thinking that we can get a little bit more domain uh, before we're ready to go to the operating room. Um, next to that um, seal sac, you can see a little blister in the skin, and that's about the most blistering that we ever get um, from uh, the tape. Um, again, here you can see you kind of have a need a helper sometimes, um, pushing all the contents in and applying strips of the Tegaderm uh, tape up and um, over the uh, defect pulling the skin and the muscle towards the midline. Uh, another picture of the second layer of tape there placed on, uh, again, showing that the skin and the muscles recruited anteriorly towards the midline in this baby. Um, and again, uh, pushing and squeezing and, and pulling towards the midline from the left and the right side. And then uh, we make the decision, okay, we think we're ready to go to the OR. Um, we think we're ready to go once um, we think that we can either close the fascia primarily, or if we think that the defect is still very big in terms of the muscle, but we have enough skin uh, to close if we have to put a patch on. 
Uh, this is another one where uh, you can see the sack is all shriveled up at this point. There's plenty of skin um, around uh, the um, uh, omphalocele sac, um, although this defect, the muscles probably on this defect, probably too um, big to close without a patch. Um, it's a little bit of a guess um, when you think you're ready to go, um, when you think you're done and as small as you can get the, the defect. Uh, we use a little bit of the remnant of the sac to uh, make a little bit of an umbilicus. And sometimes we do need a Gore-Tex patch to bridge the fascial gap, uh, thinking that um, we just can't get the edges of the muscle together. And you can do that as long as you have skin to cover your patch, which usually is not a problem. So in our series, um, we published this um, back in 2018. We had a seven year um, uh, period of time in which we had 37 newborns um, with um, Um, The ones that we can close primarily, we do so. Uh, one was treated with topical uh, betadine. Uh, three were ruptured. Um, and this method does require an intact sac. And so we were left with 10 giant phalloceles that we treated um, with our serial taping method. Um, and um, of these 10 infants, the mean gestational age was 35 and a half weeks with a birth weight of 2.84 kilograms. Um, many of these kids have other um, issues. Four out of our 10 had chromosomal abnormalities and seven had other major anomalies as well as the emphalocele. Our mean time to closure after birth was about two weeks. Um, they stayed in the NICU for about uh, 71, 72 days. Um, they again have other uh, difficulties um, which uh, sometimes keep them in the hospital. Um, out of the 10, we were able to close the fascia and the skin all in one operation in six of them. And the other four uh, were closed with a patch that was covered by skin. And three out of those four have since had the patch uh, removed and the fascia closed. The one that still has the patch even now at age nine still has uh, patches. Uh, our observations. Um, so skin integrity isn't a problem. Um, we don't have a lot of blistering. Um, I think the key here is that um, you have to apply um, the Tegaderm um, all the way back towards the flank and cover um, uh, uh, as much skin surface area as possible. So when you're pulling it across the belly wall, that uh, tension is um, distributed over as wide a surface area as possible. I think that's why we don't get um, uh, blisters. Um, our other observation is that it's surprisingly quick to get the viscera reduced into the belly. Um, the um, problem really is uh, the, belt, the fascia uh, closure that's more difficult than getting the uh, viscera reduced. Um, usually we have enough skin for coverage, um, but again, the muscle closure is a little bit harder. We have a very high rate of inguinal hernias. And um, again, we think that closing with a patch is not really, we don't necessarily see that as a um, failure if you can't get the fascia closed. And we do think that it helps maintain the domain and you can always remove it later. Uh, again, skin blistering is infrequent. Um, uh, another word about the amnion. So um, it, it doesn't stick to the um, intestinal contents, but the anterior surface of the liver frequently has amnion stuck to it. And when we go to close these, um, we don't try to necessarily take it off. Otherwise the liver would bleed. Um, and so sometimes there's a tiny little bit of amnion that um, is reduced into the belly cavity. Um, and this does um, uh, elicit an inflammatory uh, response. We see CRPs go up. We haven't had any infections, um, but um, it does seem that um, they um, have an inflammatory response in the, in the days after closure. And we've kind of learned to ignore that. Um, anecdotally, we have improvement, uh, significant improvement in respiratory function once we close the belly wall. And once you introduce belly wall um, uh, function into their breathing and close their belly wall, um, uh, we uh, have noticed a really good improvement in their respiratory function. 
Uh, we have several kids who have had also anterior diaphragmatic hernias with these giant lymphatic seals, and these can be closed um, either at the time of the surgery or after the surgery or with a patch or just primarily. And another problem that we've noticed um, is that um, if we do leave a patch or even if we close the, uh, the fascia, we've had some suture granuloma problems. Um, many of our kids have had uh, other procedures either during the initial hospital stay or after discharge have had, have to, had to come back. Um, and those are listed there. Um, suture granuloma um, removal has been um, uh, a problem. Uh, recently, I had a 12-year-old uh, come back, um, and uh, she thought she had she she had had multiple suture granulomas, and she came back thinking she had another one, and there wasn't. Um, uh, but I got to see her after so many years, um, and uh, again, inguinal hernias have been very common. So, in conclusion, we think that we can um, avoid the complications of an of of a too uh, overly aggressive early approach. Um, the tape can always be taken off and you can abort this method and go to an, a different method or something um, more like a paint and weight um, type process um, as long as your sac is still intact. Um, we avoid multiple anesthetics. We achieve earlier closure of the belly during infancy and it provides yet another method for um, this very difficult problem. Uh, here's one of my favorite little guys, Kaz, and this is him at 18 months. And uh, we um, had uh, one patient with a Cantrell. This is him at three. He's now nine years old. Um, he has a patch on his diaphragm as well as his belly wall. Um, and that's our only um, omphalocele that still has a patch. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Kelly, for staying right on time. It looks like you at least have one convert so far in Dr. Garpur, who said he's going to try this the next time he has a patient. Um, okay. To maximize the responses, because there's a lot of questions both in the Q&A and in the chat, uh, maybe I'll just ask you one quick question. During sure. that process, are the patients typically intubated and are you able to feed them while this is going on? So we do not intubate them for this problem. Um, they may be intubated for some other reason. Um, I do think a lot of these babies have um, pulmonary hypoplasia and sometimes um, they are intubated um, for their um, respiratory function even without taping. Um, we have a couple of times um, uh, taped the kids and then thought, well, maybe we taped them a little bit too tightly and we removed the tape to see if the respiratory function improves. Um, the tape is a little bit stretchy. So we really haven't had, um, I don't think we've ever really taped somebody too tight, but we've thought about that and had to remove the tape and redone it. Um, they are fed during this. Yeah, we're using their intestinal tract. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And if you um, can spend just a couple of minutes while we go to Dr. Gelfand looking at the Q&A and the chat, uh, we can respond to some of those questions while the next presentation is going on. So okay. it's really a pleasure now to uh, introduce Miguel Gelfand, who will be joining us from Chile. Miguel is one of those people who always thinks outside the box, always looking for new solutions to old problems. Um, he trained in pediatric surgery in Santiago, and then following his training, he completed a neonatal surgery fellowship at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London with Professor Lewis Spitz. Um, and then he went to Australia where he did the laparoscopic fellowship in Adelaide with Professor Hawk Tan, uh, and then back to Denver where he trained again in MIS with Steve Rothenberg. Uh, Miguel's main interests are in, pedi in pediatric surgery are in the fields of MIS and neonatal surgery and he's an editor of uh, JLAST and JPS and a past president of IPEC. So it's really an honor to have him with us today. Go ahead, Miguel. Thank you very much, Sharif. Um, and thank you for being here. And again, uh, hi to everybody from all over the world. So an amazing thing you, you're doing here. So you asked me to, uh, I'm going to share my screen to talk about what we're doing with uh, on phyllo seals, giant on phyllo seals, rather than just on phyllo seals, just giant on phyllo seals are. I think we're doing basically very similar to Kelly. I'm happy that we're sharing thoughts, not maybe exactly the same thing, but basically sharing the same principles. And just to get within time, I'm going to share with you 
uh, what we're doing here in Chile for the last almost more than 20 years already. So I'm going to skip this, but basically this, this technique we're do, using, we got used from 800 grams to a normal delivery baby to 3.2 kilos. So it doesn't matter who, the size of the baby on, on the file or, or how big is the file seal, we can use it any, any of those. Um, basically there's no protocol or strategies. As we see, everybody's doing, using different approach but we are trying to get this done for the last 20 years and so far we're using this uh, non-surgical silo with very good results as almost a, a kelly show but basically we're trying to not we stop doing the, the surgical silos uh, that requires a lot of surgeries and procedures obviously we don't like to get this long-term solution uh, with this giant ventral hernia so we don't like that and uh, there's another issues in that so basically we came up with this uh, and it's using this no surgical silo management that basically we're using with um, an adhesive hydrocolor dressing, it's called Duoderm, uh, as you know. And basically it's reduced stages by stages, but we're very actively reducing the, the omphalocils to get this close as soon as possible. Uh, how it's made is very easy with a Duoderm that is cut in, in a shape form, as you see there. Uh, and you wrap basically the you wrap the the the, the omphalo seal within this uh, duoderm it, from each side uh, with a T shape uh, uh, that is uh, get into the skin and the other the T the transverse T is sur gets surrounding the the defect completely in both sides so you got you can see this shape of duoderm wrapping. The follow seal completely in a 360 degrees, and from that, this is only to to stabilize the follow seal. This wrap of, of gauze because it was too too high, so it gets turning to the other side. So it's just to stabilize, not to to um, get any any pressure. But basically, we reduce with this. What is that? This is a tongue depressor, as a normal tongue depressor the omphalo seal every 24 to 80, 48 hours, uh, very actively. We measure uh, the outcome in terms of pressure uh, with clinical signs. We don't do intra-abdominal uh, um, pressure, just clinical signs is very easy. And for me, it's as good as the, as the uh, intra uh, pressure uh, yeah, designation. So every 40, 24 to 80 hours, we actively depress the omphalo seal uh, within the, the duoderm uh, to get this flat abdomen. Uh, as, as Kelly said, exactly the same, the same shape, but coming from here in this kit, you go through to here in about between seven to 14 days. It, it depends on the patient exactly, but very actively we get this flat abdomen um, and then we move to what is called flattening the flat. So we get a little again a little uh, square of water and you we squeeze again a little bit further into the abdomen again with another water so getting the as flat as possible the 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 the, the membrane of the of the omphalo seal into the abdomen and the next step is called inversion of amnion is put the amnion inside Basically, the abdomen and try to closure the the skin edges from the, the from the fascia and the and the and the skin. So this basically reminds or is very similar to get a fascia closure without doing the surgery. That's how we measure the intraabdominal uh, pressure and see how it will basically the newborn will reflect if we go to the VOR and so see how it goes closing closing the abdomen in an anatomical uh, way. So you can see we're getting the, the skin edges of the fascia and the, uh, the skin together and tied it again with another piece of water. And then we decide the next 24 hours how the baby behaves. And he, he tolerates this, we get the baby to the, to the newborn, to the, sorry, to the OR. And in the OR, basically we do an anatomical closure uh, with the fascia and muscle we can use some uh, component separation if it's needed. And this is basically how you have to look at the end of the surgery, post-op. Uh, so from here, we go to here, this is the first, the first hours after, after the baby was delivered. 
this is about you know five to seven days this is about to seven to ten days and then to the OR. so within dr abelo from colombia so basically who who was who started with this management and me with uh, we have managed 50 giant on fallow seals uh, in about 20 something years the average weight with 2.7 from A90 to 3.7 kilos. The average uh, gestational age was 37 weeks. 40% of them presented any, somehow some comorbidity. And, and two patients of these 50 require a suture of the rupture sac. We can, we can, we actually, we suture the sac if it's open and there's no problem to get this, the same management uh, with a rupture uh, su uh, sac if it, we can uh, suture up. Uh, the silo was uh, has stage reduction uh, within 24 to 84 hours, depending on the newborn condition, how he tolerates every direction. The silo is changed every four to five days, just because it gets a, a lot of uh, uh, humidity and, and, and loss traction. That's why we have to change it every four to five days. Two of, two of the 50 patients has a local skin infection related to the silo that was treated with antibiotics. And three had episodes of high intradermal pressure that requires taking a step back with the reduction for a couple of days. From this 50, 90.75% had a primary closure and 92% has an anatomical closure. And 90% had average time to closure within the 14 days after, after being born. Uh, one only tolerate direction, but not closure uh, with, because of the comorbidities, and two require a non-absorbable mesh to achieve a, clo a complete closure within these 50 patients. And we use a uh, Gore-Tex with these patients. There were no mortality related to the technique, and all four patients although died, but basically associated to the malformation that had uh, among the onphalocele. And the average follow-up was almost 60 months between six and 289 months. The conclusion is that for us, it's been very effective and safe. It's a very easy procedure to perform, uh, only requiring one surgery uh, uh, as, as the previous uh, presentation, and we reduce the morbidity and they're no mortality related. And cosmetically, we have very good results. Be, be, at the beginning of the how we manage this, we start having this old patient intubated and sedated all the time. But the last five to six years, we uh, stopped doing that, and we only sedate the patient with age, uh, every reduction. So the patient, all the rest of the time, is completely awake with no ventilation unless it's required for any other reasons. Uh, here's my contact information. We did that, and basically, is that sure? That's my, how we do this in Chile, basically. Thank you, Miguel, very much. Uh, the, both of those approaches, by the way, are published. So if you'd like all the details, um, you'll find them there. And again, Miguel, in the next uh, few minutes, if you don't mind looking at the chat and the Q&A, and uh, I know there's some questions for you. I had just one quick question. You said you invert the amnion and try to close the muscle over it. Is that correct? Yes, we basically we invert the amnios inside the mouth and, and every the edge of the skin and the fascia is get together, attached with the duoderm. So it's like being closed, but without a surgical procedure. And we see how the baby tolerates or not this thing. Right. But when you do your final closure, you still keep the amnion or do you remove it? We remove it. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you so much. Now we're going to go right across the world to uh, Dr. Will Alexander. Dr. Alexander is actually a plastic surgeon, but he works quite uh, commonly in major abdominal wall reconstructions, including with pediatric surgeons. Um, he uh, did a subspecialty training in pediatric microsurgery and hand surgery. He's involved in many complex reconstructions with surgical teams, particularly after sarcoma resection or treatment of congenital defects. He is on the plastic surgery faculty at Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and also has a private practice in Melbourne. So, Will, we look forward to hearing your approach. Fantastic. Thank you uh, for having me, Shreef. Can you see my screen there now? Mm -hmm. Right. Perfectly. Yep. So, I'll, as you said, I, this isn't something I do every day. I'm a plastic surgeon. Um, I get involved when there's any major kind of tumor reconstruction at our hospital and then 
this kind of fell into that remit of unclosable defects. And that's that's how I fell into this uh, position. So I really enjoy those first two talks. This is completely the other end of the spectrum in terms of um, invasiveness for the patient. But this similarly has been published. This was in uh, Annals of Plastic Surgery uh, a couple of years ago. So the obvious problem here in the slightly older child is visceral abdominal disproportion uh, and the discrepancy between the volume, uh, not just the tissue length, but the volume of the extra abdominal sac uh, relative to the underdeveloped peritoneal cavity. And you're clearly trying to almost achieve the impossible. So when we were asked to get involved, the issue obviously that everyone's highlighted already today is the deficient abdominal domain and wall components and the danger of increasing uh, the pressure too quickly. So uh, as a think about plastic surgical techniques, can we move tissue there such as a flat reconstruction? In this situation, it's not really a feasible option. And so the, then the following question is, can we make tissue uh, and more importantly, make volume? And uh, why not? Because we do it all the time. And so we use tissue expansion regularly uh, in with the most common situation now is breast reconstruction, uh, placing a tissue expander and in, inflating it uh, in preparation for a, a breast implant. Uh, so that's an example where we use tissue expansion for volume and tissue production. And this example on the right is uh, just an example of making tissue more so in the pediatric setting. We do this day in, day out at the hospital for various skin lesions. But the real question is, that will this work in the abdomen? Because if you think about tissue expansion as a concept, it's a, it's a water balloon. And to expand one of the aspects of the balloon, you need something hard to push against. And uh, it obviously does work because it works all the time. Uh, pregnancy is the precedent here where the slow expansion of the uterus um, certainly does expand all aspects of the abdomen and the domain. So this was our plan. We had a uh, six-year-old boy referred to us with this uh, uh, giant and uh, He had had some dressings as an infant and was left with this um, uh, situation that you can see in the bottom right corner. And we thought we'd put in some tissue expanders. Uh, we put four in, and uh, I think with retrospect, we wouldn't have bothered with this subcutaneous one in the epigastric region because we didn't need it. And almost got in the way, but the more important ones were the ones that were intra-abdominal and pre-peritoneal. Uh, his defect at time of operation measured 15 by 13 uh, by nine centimeters. Uh, and the uh, volume as measured on CT was 920 uh, mils. So in the first stage procedure, we placed those four expanders in, and that's the picture on the far left here. We used a uh, midline incision uh, to get the largest expander, which was the lower abdominal expander, which was a 400 cc expander. These were Integra um, uh, branded expanders. And then on each side, uh, we used uh, a 280 mil um, expander on each flank by a pararectal incision and then muscle splitting approach. We delayed uh, his, um, so I'll go back one. We delayed his uh, first expansion for uh, two weeks following the placement of the expanders. Uh, and he was he went home day two or three post-op uh, after the first stage. So we delayed it for, for two weeks and we started expanding. We had planned to expand these up over a period of four to five months, but uh, obviously there's issues with compliance and, and this child didn't tolerate the weekly expansions as planned. And so in the end, it, it did take seven and a half months to achieve the full expansion volume, which was uh, 1,410 mils in the lower three expanders. So we overexpanded well above the volume of the uh, sac to create enough abdominal domain. Here's a uh, scan that we did just before we removed the expanders. You can see the three large expanders taking up uh, a huge volume in his abdomen. 
Uh, at the second stage, we removed the, uh, obviously dissected the contents away from the sac and removed the expanders via an intra-abdominal approach. And you can see here that the uh, fascia is closable in a, uh, down the midline in anatomical fashion, uh, and the contents just fell back into the abdomen. We did put a small patch as an onlay reinforcement here, but probably wasn't necessary. So you can see some shots here uh, preoperatively after the first stage uh, and then three months postoperatively. This child's found his way into most magazines and newspapers around uh, the country. And when we look back at the literature, we weren't the first people to use expanders in the abdomen. Uh, however, we've done it very differently to previous reports. Uh, you can see here our cases in the bottom of this table. And the, the key point of difference is that in all the previously described uh, cases, these were in, in the newborn or infant period, and they were a single expander placed intraperitoneally in the pelvis. Only one was used, and they were expanded over a pretty <clears throat> uh, quick time frame, usually less than, less than a month, with quite small volumes of expansion. And each in each of the previously described cases, the fascia was only able to be closed in three stages, and in the state in the cases where there was only two stages used, that was uh, there was a uh, mesh used to bridge a defect. The other key point was that we didn't have any um, kids; uh, we have we we didn't stay on ventilation for our children. So I suppose to summarise the advantages and disadvantages of our, of our technique against other uses of expanders, not against what the uh, previous speakers have talked about, is that we were able to achieve closure in an older child in only two stages. Uh, each, at a, on each occasion, he was only in the hospital for uh, three to four days, and there was no clinically relevant increase in intra-abdominal compartment pressure. Uh, but the weakness is, you know, tissue expanders are prone to failure. Uh, they, they do leak, they do collapse. Uh, and they do fracture, uh, and we've got limited experience with this. We don't have case numbers like the previous two uh, speakers. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I feel a bit of a, a misfit amongst a uh, group of paediatric surgeons, but it's interesting to hear what other specialties are doing. Uh, if ever you are in Melbourne, obviously you're welcome to come and have a look at our hospital, and I've got my email there if you need to get in touch. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much, Will. We're not we're not afraid to ask the help of others when we need it. So it's wonderful to have you here with us. So um, again, if you could just go to the Q and A afterwards. But would you would you then think this is really more ideal for the older child who has lost abdominal domain? You have not used it in in babies, is that right? Yeah, correct. I I, I think there's there's better techniques in babies. This is more for the older uh, older child, uh, and it works really well. It's it's obviously a it's a biggie. It's a big impact on their life and the family's life to come in weekly for expansions. It's not, I'm not arguing this is a perfect situation, but in the situation of a kind of sporty grown child, this is, this is I think, probably the best way to get the, the fascia closed directly. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to jump uh, back to the center of the world, Africa, where we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Amma. Dr. Amma, of course, is known to all of you in the global surgery world. He is professor and chief consultant, uh, pediatric surgeon at the National Hospital in Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, he focuses his research on neonatal surgery and surgical infections, and his global health work focuses on access to children's surgical care in low resource setting. Uh, he is the lead editor of a recent textbook, second edition, a comprehensive pediatric surgery textbook for Africa, and the immediate past chair of GICS, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, and he is the current uh, PAPSA president. So again, honored to have you with us, uh, Emmanuel, and he will share with us his uh, Nigerian experience. Go ahead and put your presentation on presentation mode, Emmanuel, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sheriff, for the kind words. Um, greetings to everyone. Right. 
uh, greetings to everyone from Nigeria. So I'm going to be sharing about our experience uh, from uh, uh, Nigeria. And um, some of our current considerations uh, for the approach that we use uh, is the so our definition for a giant or fallow skill will be those that uh, have a defect diameter more than uh, 10 centimeters. Manuel, um, your, your voice is breaking a bit. Uh, Try turning your camera um, off. Sometimes what we face in our setting is that you know, these babies in to us in a few hours after birth, but many of most present to us are very ill. We have lived um, in neonatal intensive care facility, especially where the late uh, support is had. And many of these are already contaminated by high risk, high risk. Also, So Ray, I think we're having some trouble with um, Emmanuel's network. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so I don't know, Emmanuel, if you're hearing us. Um, I think we'll go, we'll go to, um, to Professor Arul uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom and then we'll come back again, Emmanuel. Um, we'll try maybe with your camera off, that might make your, um, might make your connection better, but... Um, uh, Really happy now to go to Mr. Surin Arul. Um, Mr. Arul is a pediatric surgeon at Birmingham Children's Hospital in the UK. His major interests include surgical oncology, laparoscopy, congenital anomalies, vascular access and trauma. And he has also served for three years uh, as a military general surgeon, uh, an experience that really strongly impacts his practice. So Surin, thanks again for being with us. We'll give you the floor and then we'll go back to Emmanuel after your talk. Great. Well, th thank you very much, everybody. It's a great privilege to uh, be here. Um, I work at Birmingham Children's Hospital in the UK, uh, and that's my email address and my hospital there if uh, anybody's ever interested in visiting us. Uh, OK, so I'm going to give this talk with the, the help of the photos of a, a little girl called Bluebell. Um, and as you know, we're discussing whether it's best to do an early closure or um, a delayed closure. Now, our approach is the use of Manuka honey. And I think one of the things that's really benefited our department is the fact that all the surgeons there use exactly the same technique. And that's allowed uh, a great increase in uh, nursing expertise. So we're conservatively dressing the, the sack with Manuka honey, and that's done by our nurses. And the key to, to doing that, just, it allows us to feed them early, initially by NG tube and then orally. Um, and basically once they're fully fed, uh, so long as there's no other comorbidities keeping them in hospital, uh, they go home and these dressings are done at a clinic at home and by the nurses. Okay, we'll do an MRI scan at nine months to look at the, the defect and the contents and do surgery at a year. And I'll take you through that with some photos. Uh, just in terms of, of our experience over eight years, we had 24 patients. Now, we're also at Birmingham, a major cardiac centre, probably the biggest in the UK. So we see a, a lot of serious ca uh, congenital cardiac anomalies and all the deaths that we had were related to that, particularly right heart uh, problems. Um, but there you go, you can see the, the uh, demographics. And we had 14 patients that we treated by this technique who, who didn't have the cardiac problems and they were uh, treated entirely at their own hospital. They didn't get transferred to the, the tertiary centre at all. They were visited by our nurses. And what we found was that by taking a very gentle approach to the sac, that actually we could get them up to full feeds very quickly within six days and sometimes much earlier. There's a small number that have um, other problems with bad reflux. Uh, but, but the majority are getting fed pretty quickly. And that also means that we get them home early, okay, on full feeds. And as you can see, the time to epithelialization, however, 
is a long time, you know, uh, over over two and a half months. But because we've got them home, we're going to argue that it's not such a big problem. OK, uh, and by taking this approach, only one patient actually needed a fund application and all patients at a year are already fed. OK, and that's the, the core of my team. Uh, Tracy Hill and Louise Lawrence are outreach nurses. Um, and it's also meant that because we use the same technique, we can counsel the parents really um, easily. You know, we've got photo books of pre, uh, past patients that we can show them antenatally because they are all terrified when they hear about uh, uh, this condition and they news Google. So there we go. We uh, This is Bluebell day one. And all, as you know, you've got a translucent sack. So we take photos early and they can be emailed to the surgeon so that we don't need to go and visit them and we don't need to transfer them uh, to the local center. We use manuka, medicated manuka honey gel um, and there's a, a honey mesh and then we cover it with sterile gauze and crepe bandages. Initially this is done by the, the nurses and then they start teaching the parents, they come up to clinic and then the parents do it at home and send photos into the nursing team. As you know, the sac turns opaque and thickens. It starts to dry out. Um, honey's got a high osmotic um, characteristic, so that helps to dehydrate the sac and harden it off, uh, which also makes it quite strong. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say we do swab the, the sac every, every time we change the dressing, um, and you'll get a number of different uh, bugs colonizing it but we'll only treat them if the child is uh, systemically un unwell which is actually fairly rare and so as you know the eschar um, thickens up and hardens and then it starts uh, breaking off in chunks to leave healthy granulation tissue underneath um, and the skin uh, uh, creeps up from the base it's worth warning the parents what to expect because uh, I think they, they're always a little bit uh, frightened when they first see that. And so you can see that it's taken quite a long time for hers to epithelialize because uh, it's got such a narrow base to it. But because she was at home, even though she had problems with reflux and needed oxygen for her pulmonary hyperplasia, we got her home. OK, and it was 18 weeks before she was fully epithelialized. So then at nine months, we did an MRI scan and you can see the, almost all of the liver is there. You can see the uh, IVC is just below the skin. Um, and so really quite a, a challenging defect. But you can see um, from these photos that it's not bothered her at all. You know, this is her, her with her parents. She's starting to, to move around, trying to walk. And because we've got a home, she's a she's a happy, normal infant. You know, we're treating them as a normal baby, not as uh, an exomphalos. And I think that's been a real, a really important thing that we have learned. So there you go. This is uh, us doing the surgery. You can see a big defect with a narrow neck. Um, I've done the I the ultrasound just to show you that the IVC is literally just underneath the skin. Um, so we separated off the skin, the liver's there just in my hand on a thin pedicle, but we were then able to, to reduce that. Um, she had quite bad reflux, so we did an open fund application at the time. Um, and then we, we tend to do a component separation. We've, we've rarely, uh, in fact, I don't think we've ever had to use a, a patch in these um, patients. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we're waiting till they're, they're older, um, their diaphragms and their abdominal muscles are, are much stronger than um, they would they they would be at a, uh, if you did it as a newborn. That's that's our theory though. Uh, so then we use the extra um, skin to you to do an umbilicoplasty. The reason her incision is going off. Uh, to the left like that is her IVC is directly under the under the skin. I didn't want to injure it. And you can see that, you know, we've got a good cosmetic result with her. So just some key learning points. The honey dressings work really well. They're really cheap um, and they're easy to teach parents to do at home. And I think that's a big um, uh, plus point for this. There's a huge benefit of nursing outreach. Uh, in supporting the parents. They spend a lot of time with the parents. They'll teach them how to do the dressings. 
and then the parents can also form their own little um, help group to support each other. We do swab the, the sac weekly, but we only treat if the uh, patient becomes unwell, which is actually pretty rare. Uh, we do a CT scan or MRI at nine months for planning because you really need to know what the vascular chair is doing. In the few patients that have had uh, pulmonary hyperplasia, we get the respiratory physicians um, involved early and they, they can be really uh, helpful in optimizing their chest prior to surgery. Uh, we really believe that waiting for a year allows the muscles and the diaphragm to be much stronger um, and reduces the chance of of liver kinking when, uh, when you reduce the contents. We like component separation because it avoids the need for a patch. Um, but the real point I want to bring across is the importance of normalizing infancy. So some fo more photos of Bluebell, that's her just um, a month after surgery. And then you can see within uh, 18 months, she's now already fed, she's reduced her oxygen. And then that is her uh fairly recently parents sent me some some photos so just to conclude the conservative management with manuka honey allows uh, the early establishment of of uh, feeds because we're not putting any pressure on the abdominal contents and it also allows early discharge from hospital because we have the support of these outreach nurses we tend to do our definitive closure at about a year um, and that's producing a good cosmetic and functional result. Um, the real key to this is the is the support of the nursing team um, who can visit the families uh, at their local hospital. And so therefore they don't need to be transferred to the tertiary center, okay? It allows expertise in managing the dressings and teaching parents. It reduces the need for transfer and it improves um, parent support and training. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to Bluebell for letting me use her photos for this presentation. Uh, thank you, Sharif. Thank you, Surin. Uh, that's a very sweet approach. You know I had to say that, right? Uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I, a couple of quick questions. So, you know, I, spending a lot of time in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think, taught me that we, we talk a lot about what you, you put on the, the sack, but it, it doesn't really seem to matter. You know, I see a lot of kids who were sent home thinking they will not survive and the parents just put rags on it and we get the same effect. So do you think this has anything to do with the Manuka honey or is it just really a health services issue because you have the you know, ability to support patients on an outpatient basis and you have your outreach nurses? That's one question. The second question is, is has the MRI actually influenced how you repair this? I mean, I, I've, I've never thought of actually getting imaging before operation. Uh, so the first one about what you paint it with, I mean, um, all sorts of things have been, have been published over the years. Uh, iodine, mercury, um, flamazine, silver dressings, et cetera. And I think you're, you're right. It, it doesn't make that much difference. I think some of the other things have been shown to have uh, complications associated with it because of absorption. So um, mercury and iodine have both been shown to have problems. Even silver can be, uh, it's been published that that can be an absorption. Um, how how important that is clinically, I don't know. Um, honey uh, works well without those complications. Um, it certainly published its bacteria um, uh, static effects. Uh, and I do think it helps to to dehydrate the the sac, but it's also cheap and easy to use. You know, so you're not you're not having to do any monitoring of the of the families, and and because it's it's easy to use, it's easy to teach the parents. So I think that that's part of the reason why we've settled on this. We have tried all of the others, um, but in terms of teaching parents to do it, you know, actually this is one of the easiest. So so that's why we've used it. But you know, I'd be perfectly able to support uh, people using other dressings. Um, in terms of imaging, I think it really makes a difference. I think, you know, certainly in my head, I like to have a 3D model of what I'm coming up against. And, and you can definitely see uh, that those images I showed you of Bluebell, you know, you wouldn't want to come across that that IVC as you cut into the, uh, into the abdomen, you know. So, you know, if you can, you know, get it, it'll, it'll help, I think. Um, okay. but, you know, yeah. 
Thank you so much. So let's go back to Emmanuel. Emmanuel will try to present with your camera off to see if we get better um, network um, availability. All right, so um, apologies for the fluctuation in my connection. Um, so I try to do it without um, the camera on. Uh, so um, I was saying that uh, for us in our setting, um, some of the reasons for our current approach is the fact that many of the babies they are not coming to us few hours after bed. Uh, many of them come several days after bed, uh, very ill and is affected. Limited uh, intensive care facilities, especially dietary support or nutritional support required, and there's a high rate of. Okay, we lost Emmanuel, so uh, we will try one more time after Dr. Leah's presentation. So Emiliana is a, a very young and upcoming uh, pediatric surgeon from Indonesia. She's an attending staff in uh, Hassan Siddiquin Hospital in Bandung, West Java, Indonesia. And she also teaches pediatric surgery residents in Hassan Siddiquin Hospital and medical students in uh, Pajajaran University. She currently serves as Chief of Continuous Professional Development for the Indonesian Pediatric Surgical Association, and she was the immediate uh, past GAP Fellow at the annual meeting of the Pacific Association of Pediatric Surgeons in Ecuador last year. So Emiliana, take it away, and then we'll, we'll try one more time with Dr. Ama afterwards. Okay, thank you, Sarif. Um, it's been an honor for me to be in this webinar, so I'll try to share my screen. Okay, hi everybody who is watching from around the world. My presentation is about our experience in Hasan Sadikin Hospital in Bandung, Indonesia. So we usually manage... Sorry, we usually manage our patient uh, mostly with non-operative treatment because we have a limited intensive ward and uh, of course uh, limited resources. Okay, so um, during uh, eight, seven, eight years, we have uh, 46 cases of omphalocele and uh, the patient usually came to our hospital. Uh, if the patient born in our, our hospital, of course, it's zero days, but uh, some of our patients came from another hospital, already treated in another hospital, or they just born uh, helped by midwife or, or um, like Shman, and then revert to our hospital. So, uh, we have the oldest patient is like 31 days old. The uh, uh, boys compared to girl are 22, 24, and around 40% uh, patient uh, admitted to our hospital uh, less than 24 hours. Okay, so this is uh, our patient. The patient uh, came with defect less than four centimeters, about 29 uh, cases, and uh, defect around four centimeter and, uh, and 10 centimeters, it's 12 case. And uh, actually we only have one who, uh, giant on follow seal, more than uh, 10 uh, centimeters. Okay, and uh, like others, maybe Ophalocil came with a lot of associated anomalies. Most of it is uh, cardiac anomalies, um, around 23%. And then uh, other is GI anomalies like uh, CDH or anorectal malformation. 
and we have a uh, urology anomalies such as um, bladder extrophy and other anomalies. Okay, so uh, the management in our hospital is first we need to stabilization and then we assess the associated anomalies and then we apply topical silver sulfadiacin. I believe many uh, institution or hospital use this topical silver sulfadiacin because it's easy to, uh, to get and uh, cheap. So, um, in our hospital, we use topical silver sulfadiacin, and then uh, we do the abdominal closure. Uh, usually, after one year old, maybe it's uh, similar to Doctor uh, Arul uh, uh, treatment. Uh, some of our patients, we, we also uh, close uh, abdominal closure um, in the newborn when they uh, have a rupture of the sac or, or uh, we have the uh, intensive care unit. So this is the, the uh, sac, ampalocyl sac that uh, we apply the um, topical silver sulfadiacin. So the patient came to our hospital and then we apply the uh, cream of uh, silver sulfadiacin and then we wrap it with sterile ghost and uh, we change the, the, the ghost every day. So uh, we, we apply again the silver sulfadiacin cream and then we, we uh, cover it with sterile ghost. And um, usually after 10 days and uh, 10 to 14 days, and the, the parents already um, can apply by themselves, we send the patient home. We discharge the patient. So uh, the, the parents continue to apply the silver sulfadiacin uh, at home. And then they uh, we follow up, uh, they, they, they uh, came to our hospital every month to get uh, the follow up. Okay, this is the patient that we treated with uh, topical silver sulfadiacin and then uh, the sac, the oncolocyl sac become uh, ascaritic uh, tissue and then become uh, skin. And this is the patient with uh, came with a uh, ventral hernia, hernia ventralis. And this is the patient who came with uh, also with a lower midline syndrome. So we, we did some uh, stomas in this patient. Yes, this is the patient who already uh, become skin. And then we uh, do the, colors, uh, the surgery for abdominal closure, usually after one year, one year old. Okay, this is uh, probably a little big uh, defect and we have to uh, make some skin flap to closure the uh, abdominal. <clears throat> and some of the uh, uh, issue that we have is infection, of course, and uh, sepsis probably in uh, two patients. And... Uh, rupture, oncolocal, our patient came with rupture. And uh, we quite have a lot of uh, that uh, around 17 uh, patient or 37% patient uh, came with uh, uh, that. Uh, the patient usually uh, has uh, major associated anomalies or uh, patient with, with a septic condition that uh, become worse. So we have like 70 uh, patient uh, died. So the challenges in our hospital, probably the delay treatment and um, maybe we, we need to uh, assess the patient and uh, of course limited intensive work that we cannot make 
uh, we cannot do the surgery um, immediately because uh, limited intensive work and limited uh, resources in our hospital. So our conclusion is that topical sil silver sulfadiazine are safe for conservative treatment of omphalocil, especially in um, limited resources like our center property. Okay, thank you, Sarif. I think that's from us in Bandung, Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emiliana. So a more uh, standard classic technique that still works well. Okay, yeah. third time the charm. We're gonna go back um, to Emmanuel. Again, if the, if the faculty can take a look at the Q&A, there are some questions for you in the Q&A in addition to the chat, if you could take a look at that as we try with Dr. Emma uh, third time. All right, so I hope it works this time. Um, but so some of the background to um, our current approach is the fact that many of the babies are presenting late, are uh, very ill, uh, already the sac is in contaminated or infected uh, many times, and we have limited intensive care uh, facilities, especially when ventilatory support and nutritional support uh, are required. And uh, previously we've had patients who have been um, <clears throat> treated elsewhere, uh, with just um, uh, painting and escar waiting for escar to form. And we've had them coming to us with very large, uh, almost unmanageable uh, ventral hernias. Right, so our current approach is, is mainly based on a, an initial non-operative treatment, uh, which will institute once the baby is, uh, we consider it stiff, no respiratory issues, uh, no glycemic issues, and the baby is feeding uh, and passing stool. For those that have clamps on the umbilical cord, we take it off uh, to prevent it from um, <clears throat> eroding the, uh, the sac. Uh, and our initial treatment mainly is uh, daily cleaning and dressing of the uh, omphalocy sac. For those that come infected, uh, we, 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 we do the dressing on a daily basis. Uh, as the infection is controlled, uh, then we change to uh, alternate day dressings. Uh, we've, uh, we use both 1% silver sulfadazine and honey, uh, but we are, honey that is really not processed um, uh, and has not had any added uh, materials to it. And um, uh, but of recent, we are tending more towards honey uh, because we've looked at the rate of um, epitalization of the sac between honey and silver sulfadazine, there was really no difference, but it took uh, less days uh, uh, with honey than with silver sulfadazine. Uh, the infection rate uh, appears to be the same, but once the sac is infected, we, we usually prefer to use uh, honey. The patients are also on antibiotics, again, because many of the sacs are already infected. We usually we give them some tetanus prophylaxis, especially if the mother has not received such during pregnancy. Uh, this is because by the time they present, uh, some families would have already applied different types of um, materials on the sac. Uh, so once we consider it safe, uh, we will then apply compressive uh, bandaging uh, using an elast elastic bandage uh, while the baby is in hospital. Uh, without any ventilation and is feeding. Uh, so we will apply it very firm, but not enough to cause respiratory difficulty. It's done initially by our nurses and our trainees, and then the parents are taught uh, how to do it. So once all infection is controlled and baby is doing well, we will usually discharge them home for the parents to continue that at home. And um, uh, they will continue the dressing of the omphalocele alternate days once there's no infection until uh, the entire um, uh, sac uh, is covered uh, with, with skin. Uh, and so uh, so we, this one of the patients uh, with progressive compression. So at two months, uh, most of the, uh, um, the omphalocele has co almost completely reduced and um, we will continue the compression until we consider it safe for surgery to be done. Uh, this child didn't have any compression, and because of that, the um, 
ventral hernia is still quite large. And then when we repair the hernia, usually uh, our timing is six months to uh, one year, depending on um, when we consider it safe uh, to close, but the scheme must be completely uh, epithelialized. And uh, for some of them, we're able to repair the defects primarily. For those that were unable to repair primarily, we will place in uh, a non-absorbable um, uh, patch. So the, some of the advantages of our current approach is that it helps us to, the compression uh, bandaging helps us to progressively increase the abdominal cavity. And it also helps to reduce the volume of the omphalocele itself and the defect diameter also tends to, uh, to shrink. But obviously, a disadvantage is that this takes some uh, takes some time. Uh, but considering uh, the the limitations in terms of intensive care and the the, the delayed presentation of the uh, babies, we think that uh, this is something the families are able to cope with. We don't keep them in hospital uh, for too long, but there's always the potential for infection to happen. Uh, so because of that, we follow up closely. Uh, some of the sacs may actually rupture during this treatment if it hasn't um, epithelialized completely. Incarceration may happen. And in some of the patients, the base of the omphalocy may be too narrow to allow uh, for uh, progressive compression. So this child uh, was treated um, uh, initially without any compression, and the base is so narrow. So usually in those situations, what we do is we go back uh, and just through a small incision, uh, we we widen uh, the defect, the fascia, uh, so that we can continue with our uh, progressive compression or we consider it safe uh, to repair the omphalocene. In the two years uh, between 2021 and 2022, we've um, treated 15 patients. Uh, one of them, the defect diameter was less than 10 centimeters. So this was uh, closed primarily. Uh, by the age of 11 days. 14 patients were those we consider were giant. Um, with our current method, at the age of 12 months, one of them have had a primary fascia repair. Uh, seven of them are still undergoing uh, compression treatment. Now, one of the challenges we have is that quite a large number of the patients actually come with multiple anomalies, some of them that are not survivable and severe pulmonary hypoplasia. And because of our limited intensive care facilities, uh, many of those actually uh, died. And uh, within this uh, same period, one other patient who was treated previously has had uh, the, uh, the uh, ventral hernia repaired. Some of the complications we, we have to deal with often uh, are, are infections of the sac. This is those that present less obviously we will treat this with antibiotics and honey dressing until the infection is controlled before we start uh, 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 compression. Uh, in some of them, the sac um, uh, is torn or ruptures. If it's a small or linear tear, we will usually uh, repair the sac and continue with our normal approach. Where the rupture is large or the, the, the tear is so ragged that it cannot be repaired, then uh, we will have to uh, we use other uh, measures uh, as appropriate. So that's how we currently manage our patients. And I would like to ac acknowledge some of my colleagues uh, that have been doing some work with uh, on, um, on Fallo 6, Dr. Skoko, Sherry Olajide, and um, Dr. Shola Doe. So thank you for listening. And it's been interesting listening to all the different approaches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, and thank you for uh, fixing your connection. We could hear you very, very well. Excellent. So as we go into the discussion, I just wanted to share a quick slide with you. Give me just one minute. So I just want to um, let you know about another event that you may have already seen. Um, but will be happening tomorrow, eight o'clock our time. Um, this is a conference that we've had here at the Children's for well over four decades. And for the first time, we will actually be broadcasting it live. Um, so this is a different a bit from what we're doing today, that these conferences are completely unscripted. We essentially present cases as they evolve and we get the input of not just the clinical input, but also the radiological input and the pathology input. So 
you're more than welcome to join us. And uh, it's a very different kind of discussion with a lot of um, arguments and, uh, you know, give and take between different surgeons and, and multidisciplinary specialists. Um, as we go into a discussion, I just, so essentially what we heard in the last hour, uh, you know, there are many variations, but if you think about it philosophically, it's either getting early closure of the abdominal cavity or some type of late closure. Essentially all of palatial decisions come down to one of these two. So the question is, how do you make those decisions? And this is something I've put together after looking at a lot of literature of asking a number of questions. So the first question, of course, is the liver in the omphalocele? I don't think the diameter is as important as whether the liver is inside or out. So there's not really a classic definition for giant omphalocele, but I think we all agree that if the liver is herniated, that omphalocele is going to be a challenge. So if the liver is not herniated, I think all of those, or at least the great majority, should be closed primarily, and those patients obviously are, are the easier population. If the liver is herniated, then the next question we ask is, is there significant cardiopulmonary morbidity? Is there a significant congenital heart defect? Is there significant pulmonary hypoplasia? Does the patient have oxygen needs, et cetera? And if that's the case, then we do not try to do any type of primary closure. If there isn't, and this is an isolated omphalocele, then the next question is, is there abdominal domain? And how do you decide that? Well, part of it is we actually look at the prenatal data. When there have been prenatal ultrasounds, we look at the omphalocele uh, diameter over the, uh, the abdominal circumference. And that actually we found correlates pretty nicely with how the abdomen will be when the baby is born. But a lot of it is also looking at the physical exam of the baby and really looking at the abdominal cavity and seeing many times you can just squeeze the omphalocele and you feel that it will go in. So if there is abdominal closure, we still will go to abdominal domain, we'll go to primary closure. And if there isn't, then we will resort to some type of uh, stage closure, but still try to, to, to get closure early. Now, having said that, as I said at the beginning, every practice is local. So you really have to take this decision tree and adjust it to your own, um, to your own situation. So let's now take a look and see um, what we have in the chat. And uh, we have a, uh, still some time to be able to interact with our faculty. Um, okay, so there's a, a, um, a comment on the role of Botox. And uh, I think Dr. Veronica Polite from Ecuador is with us, Veronica. Um, is a resident in Guayaquil, Ecuador. I think I met her a few months ago in Ecuador and she uh, was hoping to take a couple of minutes to share with us their experience quickly and what they do using Botox. So Veronica, if you're on the call, uh, we can bring your presentation up. It should be pretty short. Are we able to bring Veronica's presentation up, Ray? Uh, I don't think I have that. Which one is that? Um, is that the, this uh, is Veronica Polite from Ecuador. Okay. I don't know if she's, are you able to let her share? Uh, yeah, let me just find her. Hold, hold on. Okay. You just go down to the list. She's under V. Yep. Um, in the meantime, Ray, maybe we can put up a case that was uh, also submitted by Dr. Steen Heyman from Antwerp, Belgium, because I think this is actually great to uh, guide the discussion of what to do with a, a really difficult patient. And I think well, we have that picture. I do have that, and let me get him on here too. Hold on. Okay, very good. Yes, hello. Hello, good uh, more afternoon in the from Belgium. Uh, and thank you very much. I have the opportunity to present this short case. So I'm Stan Hammond. I'm a pediatric surgeon from Antwerp, the Queen Paola Children's Hospital. It's a great honor to present this special case, uh, uh, which I saw on a humanitarian mission. I go also every year to Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a small girl, uh, now two and a half years old. She comes to Belgium the end of May. And I saw her uh, on a two weeks mission there with a large giant on fallow seal. Um, the scarce information I had, there is no consanguinity. 
postnatally, she had a defect, facial defect of seven centimeters um, with the liver, gallbladder, small bowel, colon, and spleen inside the, the omphalo seal. And the, the volume was measured there on a CT scan postnatally um, of the hernia was 2,100 um, cubic uh, meter centimeters, and the volume of the abdomen was cubic millimeter 620. So a big discrepancy between the abdominal uh, wall of the abdominal de defect and the omphalo cell itself. So I was wondering what uh, your opinion as big experts on this field would be to treat this uh, little girl, uh, which is coming to Belgium. She has a visa for three months, which can be prolonged, of course. She, they want to go back to Benin afterwards. But uh, we were thinking of Botox component separation. Uh, we heard some things about the spacers, spacers and things like that. But um, I would like to hear, if possible, your opinion. Do you have Do any you have big picture? picture? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so here we have an older patient with what, what looks uh, like seeing not much abdominal domain. I'm curious, have you tried to squeeze this at all to see if yeah. some of it can go in? Yeah, I observed her for uh, one night in the, in the local hospital. Um, gave her not too much food because the mother, of course, told me it grows during the day when she eats, but it was not completely reponable. Now she's having some kind of elastic bandage to get some abdominal domain locally but it's not getting a lot more um, reduced. So it's not very easy to reduce at this moment. No. It, it looks very narrow, the base from the yes. CT, or is it just me, Stephen? It's very, it's very narrow, yeah. It's very narrow at the base. Yeah, and yeah that's true. Okay. I think it, compressing from the outside only will be a very long time and even impossible if you have the very, very narrow entrance between the abdomen and the umphalo seal. I think from us will be uh, a white thing to, uh, to, to do maybe to extend the, the base of the, the effect just to try to gain mm -hmm. some domain from external uh, compression, I mean. Okay. And is it just a green that's inside or, it, or is there any liver? Sorry, I didn't hear it well. Right now, is there any liver still outside? Yeah, yeah, still liver outside. Yeah. And so when she comes in the end of May, of we do all the new scan, we do a new CT scan, we do a new sonography of the heart and all the, the workup for the vectoral associations. We redo it here in Belgium. But actually, this is the only image we have. We have the, an old CT scan from almost one year old and we have the clinical situation at this moment. Growth is stagnating and she's having more and more pain at this moment also. So she's she's not doing well. So, right. uh, so for... for yeah, yeah, sorry. So for we'll us, get what's... Faculty. Yeah, get the faculty input. Go ahead. Yes, for similar patients, because we have this kind of patients all the time. And what we simply do is to um, uh, just take the baby to the operating room and extend, widen the facial defect and mm -hmm. continue with uh, compression. Uh, and uh, that has worked uh, for us. It may take... Um, uh, a few, maybe two, three more months of compression once you widen the uh, facial uh, defect. And once that is done, um, uh, any pains or even problems with feeding or growth, we find that all those kind of problems uh, are addressed. Thank you. Okay, Th thanks, Emmanuel. Um, Will, is this, a, is this a case where you could use expanders? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that obviously, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but um, no, it's it. She's got that tiny abdominal domain. I think you need to make some volume somehow. Uh, I like that concept that Emmanuel just said of just opening the fascia to see if that helps a bit. But you know, th this would be a good one for the expanders. It's tricky with the uh, visa situation. Obviously, you don't know how long it's going to take, uh, but you no, know, clinically it would work definitely. Okay, Dr. Skeff is saying he would do fasciotomies, linear alba, and then fall with compression, as was mentioned. Now, Dr. Garpur, is taught, he's mentioned a lot in the chat about uh, pneumoperitoneum and uh, injecting air. Do, do, do you mind, Vivek, putting a few more comments about how you actually do that? I mean, how do you actually inject the air and, uh, and uh, how much and you know, how you go about doing that? Sheriff? Sure. Yeah. Also, I think Botox will be very good in this patient, for certainly. Okay, and it's is it a one-time injection or do you do repeat injections on at certain? You you can repeat it every three to four weeks. 
OK. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Sharif, if I could uh, have a comment. I mean, I, I would take the approach, a combination of uh, Professor Amas and uh, Dr. Alexander's approach, you know, that opening the abdomen, uh, widening the base, which we've had to do, OK, and then and actually use the opportunity to put your, your expanders in at that stage. Um, and and then and then you should be able to to close it. I think it will be I think you'll be surprised at how well she tolerates it um, at her age, you know. But but I think the key is that you don't suddenly kink the liver um, because the the blood vessels to the liver all have have all grown up into the into the abdomen like that. So if you do it all too suddenly, then then you can kink the IBC and it can be dangerous. So so that's one of the advantages of widening the base first. Mm -hmm. OK, completely agree with you, Saran. Thank you. These are great suggestions. Um, Ray, are we able to give Dr. Garpur, um, to be, are, is he able to speak at all? Um, I'm trying to find him. <laughs> He so it's, it's Vivek V I V E K, yeah. Okay. Because I, I would really I like. I got to it. I got him. I got him. I got him. Okay. Hold on. We would like to hear about this pneumoperitoneum concept. Here we go. Hold on. Okay. Is he able to speak? He is able to speak. And okay. Give him two seconds. Okay, Vivek, you're right there. You can come on camera if you like, and we will we'll hear about your approach thank you can you hear me yes perfectly fine what i is i insert a number 10 or 12 thin catheter in the left iliac fossa that is where the adhesions are minimal then connect a cannula through a filter and inject as much air as possible to distend the abdomen this is done till the patient now within the next 24 hours the air will be absorbed some of it so you repeat it this we keep doing till the bowel is able to go back abdomen in the this enlarges the abdominal cavity adequately the muscles are also stretched and all this is when patient is feeling there is no TPN or any abdominal compression. So at the end of 10 days or at the most two weeks, completely reduce the bowel and the liver and close the fascia and close. So, so intensive care in the country. It doesn't require TPN, doesn't require this abdomen and costs are also very minimal. I've done patients with excellent results, no mortality. It's very safe. It has been published in the pediatric surgeons also. Thank you, Vivek. This is it's great to know. Um, I just have a question. You know, when we do laparoscopy and we leave a lot of air, yes. uh, patients are often in, in a lot of pain and sometimes they can have shoulder pain from air under the diaphragm. Is that a, an issue at all? Do you find that these patients are that very has, uncomfortable? That has not proved to be a problem so far. Okay. So I don't know. Okay, thank you. That's really good to know. Okay, Veronica is with us. Um, Veronica, I think Ray will allow you to share your screen. Thank you. Uh, yes, Veronica, you should be able to share your screen now. Veronica, are you hearing us? It looks like here you're frozen. Hello. No, here we go. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Veronica Polit. I'm a pediatric surgery trainee from at Dr. Roberto Gilbert Elizalde in Guayaquil, mm -hmm. Ecuador. I would like to say to thank Dr. Sharif Emil for allowing me to present our management. Uh, we perform perform Hello. a three-stage approach. Uh, using negative uh, pressure, uh, injection of bottle and tox, uh, closer using um, separation of components technique. 
is a non-invasive um, healing system that applies negative pressure uh, in a localized and controlled um, way. Um, it stimulates good healing and we use it to uh, so before the device placement, we apply a to um, achieve good adherence and to avoid contamination. The sponge should cover the complete uh, defect of the, the complete defect and uh, must extend at least two centimeters beyond the skin to uh, allow an adequate pressure in all the edges. After that, um, adhesive sheets are placed and the mercury and 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 um, this device is replaced every 10 days and the wound is uncovered to note the progress the scarification of the sac and uh, to determine if an another cycle is needed after uh, the removal, we apply a 2% hydrocolic chlorexidine as part of the treatment. As we can see here, uh, this is our first, uh, our first change at day eight, when we can see a reduction of the amniums. At day 16, we have an scarification. On day 20, uh, the negative pressure system was removed and we start applying uh, chlorexidine, alcoholic chlorexidine, and on day uh, 29, the baby was discharged to home. Um, during this period, he was uh, able to receive enteral feeding and have good uh, bowel movements. And an early um, ventilation, mechanical ventilation winning. Um, maybe four months later, we use uh, the, we go to the second stage with botulinum toxin, and we take um, we take the volume of the hernia and the abdominal wall, and we use uh, five international units uh, per kilogram to apply um, the toxin botulinum toxins to application. Um, the first is along the anterior axillary line below the ninth rib, the second and the third mid clavicular line between the ribs and the iliac crest, as we can see in these pictures. Um, sadly, we do not have uh, pictures in the third stage of that patient, but this is the last one we performed in February, and we use the the component separation technique to close the defect. So we work with plastic surgeons on this patient. We have in the operating room and we do these marks to, um, up to have an, an idea of the skin edge that we, we, we will use to the closure. So this is our patient is finally restored. We do not use um, mesh, it's just the skin. And this patient is, um, is going well. We just repaired an inguinal hernia last week, but he's in, in a good way. So we think this is a good approach. We have uh, two publications. The first was um, case series using the negative pressure um, therapy. And the second was a comparative study with other techniques. Um, this is uh, our best uh, management. We use earlier an hydrocolloid 
uh, silo, but we don't have a good experience with this. So thank you so much. Thanks, Veronica. There was a question of um, what kind of pressures you use with your wound vac. Uh, we use uh, 50 to 175 millimeters of mercury, and it depends on the patient tolerance. So we um, start with the minor pressure, and if he, if the patient uh, is tolerating, we can add an extra pressure. And when you change the vac, is the baby under anesthesia or do you do it with the baby awake? No, if the baby is awake. Maybe they, they are under mechanical ventilation in because of their other comorbidities, but we do not need to do it under anesthesia. All, all the placements are performed in the, in the, at the NICU okay. and without anesthesia. Okay, and, and the other question to you is, uh, so I, I had an impression that you were using the Botox in the initial phase, but you're using it really in the second phase to help with the uh, muscle closure. And do, I mean, do you really think it makes that much of a difference once you've had complete reduction, uh, do you still really need that? Uh, maybe those two patients really need that um, the, the botulinum toxin. We have another patient with an, a smaller defect, so maybe in then it won't be necessary, but these two patients, yes. And do you feed the babies while they have the vac on? Yeah, yeah, we feed them and we have good vowel mo movements. Yeah, it's an okay. early uh, interacting. Very good. Um, there was a question of, um, you know, how do you actually assess the fascial defect? How, when you're ready to do your, your closure, uh, so, you know, um, Sarun told us he does imaging. I'm just curious, for the other faculty here, does everybody or does anybody else do routine imaging before you, you do your final closure, uh, Miguel? Yeah, we, do, we, we start using some, some images, but actually in, in clinically after didn't quite relate it completely. So doing this inversion of apneos and putting all the skin edges together with the duoderm, and waiting for 24 hours, the clinical signs were much better related to the images, basically how the baby behaves after the surgery. And going back to Kelly, you know, you you were you presented, um, I mean, like Miguel, a technique of getting early closure. I mean, are there any patients you would select? Uh, you know, would, would you agree with my algorithm at all that there are some patients? You can simply close in the first or two days, first one or two days of life, even if they have a giant emphalocele. I mean, it's interesting. Um, uh, from University College London, Mark Davenport's room, I'm sure is, is, is familiar with this. They've actually presented a large series where they just do primary closures on most giant emphalocele's. And sometimes they get a wound dehiscence, which you can treat with a vac or, you know, address it. But, and this is really an open question for all of you and on very different practice environments. Are there any patients with giant emphalocele where you would you would um, decide to close right away in the first couple of days of life if they don't have other comorbidities, you know, major cardiorespiratory comorbidities? We'll go to Miguel and then Sarun and, and Kelly. I mean, we have if if it's a real giant emphalocele, I think it's almost impossible to do a primary closure at the first day, basically. Uh, I wouldn't attempt it's very real Jaden Fowles here. Okay, Miguel, I'm gonna have to send you pictures to change your mind. <laughs> I'll do that offline. Um, Kelly. I guess I would say that I would define a giant on Phallocil as one that you couldn't close. And uh, I think that there are certainly some big ones that we have closed primarily um, fairly quickly after birth. Um, and um, then we tape the ones that we can't close. I, I think we're a little bit more um, uh, prone to try to close them if we think that, that we can get them closed. I would say that um, we have not used imaging um, to try to determine whether or not we can close the, um, 
the fascial component. I, I um, agree with others who have said that sort of clinically and, and with experience, it, it just have a little bit uh, uh, of a better idea than um, imaging has helped, ha hasn't really helped as much. Okay, thank you, Sarun. Um, so, so I'd agree. I think a, a, a true um, massive exome floss won't be closed, but I did like your idea that, that actually you could clinically just squeeze it very gently and see if it will if it will go back. If it does, if it's all full of bowel, then there's a good chance you could do that. I think there's two two dangers, Sharif. One is that you attempt and you can't close it, and then you're stuck. So then you you've you've got rid of your sack, um, and you're you're in this danger of, of putting um, a stitch silo on that then starts to get infected and break down. So then you're in a in a real trouble. The other thing about Mark Davenport's uh, paper was that they had a very high incidence of, of gastroesophageal reflux. Um, a lot of those patients ended up with fund applications and a lot of them at a year were still tube fed. So I think there are some real problems with, with pushing the contents back very hard early on. It may look clinically nice, but you haven't expanded the, the abdomen in some way. And so you're putting a lot of pressure on the, on the rest of it. So. Um, I think those are the reasons for, for being cautious. Yeah. No, I think your point is well taken. It is a gamble, a bit of a risk if you think you can close it and then you do not. And in those cases, actually, um, I've just used the silo, the, the preformed silo like we do for gastroschisis. And essentially, it's a reduction mechanism like the other types of reduction mechanisms that were. I mean, that's kind of why we've, tur we've turned it on our head, on its head, Sharif, and said, the exomphalos is not the problem. You know, it's treating the baby like a baby that that you've got to do. So, so if you can find a safe way to treat them like a baby, then then focus on that. And I think that's where we've changed really in our in our practice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, um, maybe for a couple more minutes, I'll just see if there's any other uh, questions. So there are others who also do routine MRIs uh, bef before they close. That seems like it's not an unusual. Yeah, go ahead, Sarun. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the um, uh, Kelly and Miguel who do who do the um, early uh, expansion what they do when there's a very narrow neck to the to the sack. I wasn't quite sure how they dealt with that. Um, I can answer. I have a, a, a baby now who's about two weeks old um, who um, has only the liver out, and interestingly, a very narrow sac, um, and the amnion is completely attached to the liver. It doesn't slide over the surface of the liver, so I can't really serially reduce that one, um, and I'm, I'm painting that one. Um, uh, I agree um, that, that the... Um, Fascia will have to be opened and the liver will have to be reduced very, very carefully. This baby already um, has an interrupted inferior vena cava um, and some other vascular anomalies um, in this narrow sac, uh, this narrow pedicle with, a, um, with all of the liver in the sac. So that one's a little bit unusual and it, I, I can't tape that one. Um, um, so I think still, not all infallacies are the same and you have to individualize your treatment uh, to what you have. Although I agree with, with Kelly, we, we have this, those patients that have a narrow base, when you approach them very um, early on with this pressure, the pressure stage closure, this, this patient, we were able to close it, but in a longer time. This patient will take maybe four weeks or five weeks doing the stage closer. That's one of the the right of the of, of the base of, of our series. Although the ninety something percent we can close it within fifteen days. Some of them about four or five have been even two months doing the stage closer because of that. But in this approach, we haven't opened the base even if it's narrow because somehow if it's an early approach, an early you know. Um, the, the pre, pre, pressuring the, the sac, they, they open up and we have been able to close it anyway without opening the, the narrowing. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so people are asking about the recording. So all of this will be recorded and it will be on the Hendron Project website. 
Um, I think usually Ray needs about a week, Ray, is that correct, before it shows up, but it will be all, um, it will be all there. Correct, it'll be early next week. Yeah. Have you, with those who are do, uh, doing late closures like uh, Emiliana and, and uh, Thurin and em Emmanuel, have you had problems with adhesions at the time of closure that made it uh, difficult or have you had any trouble with bowel or liver injury? Um, no, I found, I found it very, very straightforward. I think, I think it's the fact that the child is that much older, you know, they're a year, they tolerate um, anesthesia and, and pressure better the the actual abdominal contents have been have been fine the bowel's not been a problem taking the skin off the liver takes a little bit of time and you just got to give yourself the time uh to do that don't try and rush that um, but usually you've got so much extra skin that the that the thin skin that's over the liver that can be sacrificed and and what's left makes a very nice umbilicus um william will probably know much more about making a good umbilicus but it's uh uh yeah you don't have a problem with with having to uh too little skin in the in these situations yeah i, I agree with that yeah so i agree with sarun so um we, we've had patients that um the skin is very adherent to the liver uh sometimes difficult to separate but i see uh, he said there's so much skin around so so we simply will uh sacrifice the skin uh, and make sure that we don't leave any epithelial part of the skin uh, uh on the liver we've not had problems with um uh, adhesions with the intestines, so we haven't had intestinal injuries. Usually, most of the adherence is usually to the liver. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, Miguel, there's some questions. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, I had. I also have one Liana, uh, yes. one patient with a uh, addition, a liver addition, very attached to the skin and um, very huge liver. So. Uh, when we do the uh, we did the uh, abdominal closure, we have to resect the liver also. But mm. uh, it's great now. Okay. okay. Um, Miguel, there are some questions about duoderm. I mean, we're very familiar with it here, but it seems like it may not be widely available. Uh, can you give us an idea of the cost uh, in Chile? And you know, would would there be other substitutes if people don't have access to that? We we tried with a lot of different options and came up with that this time of duoderm that is fixed. Not this is not there's two a, a different type of duoderm. This is the thicker one, and it's twenty by twenty centimeters. And this has this is a stretch, but the strength enough to put some pressure. That's why we're using that. This twenty by twenty uh, duoderm that is the thicker one, and it costs about twenty dollars each. So it's not a huge amount of money and usually you use two of them every five days so at the end you can use maybe 10 or 20 so it's at, at most 400 dollars for the whole treatment in 90 percent of the patient so it's not a quite amount of money okay thank you that's that's good to know um there was a question about using uh, uh iodine based i think that has been reported in the past as well. And I think again, once you, you could probably paint the sack with anything, I think iodine, maybe we could we are concerned about a bit in terms of absorption, whether it could have any uh, sort of effects on thyroid function, but has anybody used that in the past? Uh, yes, yes, we, we have to use, to use it. Um, the iodine can have a risk on, on thyroid. That's why we, we moved away from it. Yeah. Yeah, we have used uh, povidone iodine in the past. Um, I think two main problems we found with it. One was that it was usually very messy. And when the parents were going home, uh, it was difficult for them to cope with. I think the second aspect, one of the other things we found was that somehow it doesn't really prevent infection of the sac. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it just gets inactivated very rapidly by the uh, protein tissue. And uh, yeah, so we had to stop. And Emmanuel, on that uh, topic, I'm just curious in your patients, because it's not a population, obviously, we, we see much in the West. You mentioned patients coming late with infections of the sac, but do these patients tend to have, uh, I mean, is it just that localized infections of the phalliceal sac, or do they tend to be septic and, uh, and have, you know, systemic sepsis from that? 
Yeah, many of them have systemic sepsis, and we actually lose some of those that come with systemic uh, sepsis. Yeah, when the infection is localized just to the sac, it's a little bit easier uh, to control. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Um, I think we are coming to the last few minutes. And again, I just um, want to thank the six faculty who have joined us all with different perspectives. And I think it just goes to show us that uh, we all share the same challenges and we really have to learn from each other how to uh, address those challenges. It's been a wonderful webinar to share it with all of, we had uh, at some point 420 people and I know there's a lot of others that uh, look at the live stream as well. So not everybody who's been following is, uh, was on the Zoom, many are off the Zoom as well. And hopefully Dr. Heyman will give us an update on his patient there so we can understand what has finally happened with that very difficult uh, scenario. And I just want to thank you all again. And uh, until the next abdominal wall uh, defect seminar, webinar by the Hendra Project, hopefully in a few months. And again, you're all invited to join us tomorrow for the um, next Hendra Project event with the surgery, radiology, pathology rounds. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sharif, and thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh, everyone. Great presentations. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for the